One of the first features developed for Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction was the Groovatron, a bomb that was part boombox and part laser light show. Throw the bomb, force your foe into spontaneous dance, and then kill him to a disco soundtrack. It was hilarious to watch and just as fun to play. But the music almost died when Insomniac realized that it would have to give every character, enemy, and creature a set of unique dance moves. The Groovatron would require hundreds of animation cycles, special case programming, and extra work across the entire project. In many ways, this reflected the challenge of bringing our heroes onto new hardware. The complexity, sophistication, and power of working on a new platform meant that Insomniac would need to perform at an equally complex and sophisticated level. We had our work cut out for us, but we felt we had an opportunity to create the Ratchet & Clank game we'd always imagined. John Fiorito, COO, Insomniac Games. The fresh hardware of the PlayStation 3 represented a chance for Insomniac Games to finally materialize old shelved ideas like the Groovatron, a weapon initially conceptualized as far back as Ratchet & Clank 2. It represented a new beginning, the softest of reboots, and the birth of a new saga of games that would attempt to grow up with its audience. It represented Ratchet & Clank's chance at becoming the PlayStation's Mario, transcending the barrier between console generations that had already killed off a number of mascots before. However, it also represents a fulcrum, a turning point that very few players recognize, because the trajectory of the future saga, and truly of every Ratchet & Clank game that's come since, can be pinpointed back to a single eager promise that Insomniac made to Sony here to promote this new hardware, to promote the PlayStation 3 for this game, for tools of destruction. Since 2007, Ratchet & Clank, I would argue, has been answering for one broken promise. This is what was, at the time, far and away Insomniac's most ambitious game to date. This is where Ratchet & Clank, depending on who you ask, either soared to new heights, or where it may have started to fly off the rails. This is the dangerous ambition of Ratchet & Clank Future, Tools of Destruction. For the longest time, Ratchet & Clank's first outing on the PlayStation 3 had the longest development cycle of any Ratchet game, period. Longer than Ratchet 1, longer than 2, about as long as 3 and Deadlocked combined. In fact, only two Ratchet games have had a longer pipeline than Tools of Destruction's 23 plus months. One of those is All For One, which is a completely different style of game that required a ground-up rework of everything that Ratchet & Clank was at the time, so that's a bit of a unique story. And the other is the PlayStation 5's Rift Apart, which, like Tools of Destruction, is the first Ratchet game on its respective system, considered the first big system seller of a new console generation. And, as you can imagine, that requires a lot of ground-up work, too. But while Insomniac, fun fact, may very well have had the first games ever in production for both of these consoles, like before either console's specs were even finalized, neither of those first two games they worked on were Ratchet games. In the latter's case, we saw Sony showcasing Spider-Man on PS5 hardware before Sony would even call it the PlayStation 5, and here on the PS3, Ratchet followed in the footsteps of Resistance Fall of Man, one of the only highlights of the PS3's awful 2006 launch. Although today Resistance certainly doesn't look like much, at the time it represented the culmination of Insomniac's decade of work prior. That's because it was proof that the studio could work simultaneously on multiple games, with multiple distinct teams rolling on and off of projects seamlessly without too many hiccups and without too much downtime. I've seen developers refer to such a feat, being a one-office, multi-project studio, as one of the most difficult leaps that any game studio can take, and this took Insomniac a long time to truly get right. By the end of 2003, around the time that Ratchet & Clank 2 had released, and while 3 was just beginning production, some of the studio's more tenured members had already started developing tech separately for a first-person shooter for what they thought the PS3's hardware might look like. Remember that this was three years before the system released. 
The idea to return to the FPS genre after their first ever game, Disruptor, video here by the way, was something that Insomniac set in motion as early as when Ratchet 1 had released, and they started Resistance's pre-production process so early so that by the time Up Your Arsenal was finished, most of its team could roll seamlessly onto the new project. All the while, a smaller second team would stay behind on the PS2 hardware to develop a fourth Ratchet game, and once Deadlocked was released in 2005, much of its staff also floated over to Resistance to push it across the finish line, leaving about a dozen Insomniacs to begin rebuilding everything that was Ratchet & Clank from scratch. The jump to the PS3 meant that, as the company's chief operating officer John Fiorito wrote, we were lacking hardware, an engine, game code, and even assets. We were truly at ground zero. So, looking back to square one with Tools of Destruction, Insomniac began retracing its steps from the first go-around. Before pre-production had even properly begun, the team built a new in-engine diorama using Resistance's engine, showcasing the city of Metropolis, one of the very first vistas conceptualized for Ratchet & Clank 1, the vista that led to that first game even being greenlit by Sony. To say this little test overachieved might be an understatement, as the teaser received an overwhelmingly positive response when shown at 2006's Game Developers Conference. It began everybody's favorite trend of comparing Ratchet & Clank to Pixar films, and it set the expectation within Sony that Insomniac had to, quote, drop jaws every time they showed the game off after this. From here, the skeleton crew of just 15 people that were working on Tools of Destruction began building out the, pardon the pun, tools needed to facilitate an easier production pipeline for the staff once Resistance was finished. They spent months and months creating new visual assets, models, trying to get things like movement speed and animations just right so that it all felt like the PS2 games, and figuring out what Ratchet would even look like on PS3. After dozens of different attempts, they eventually settled for... weird fuzzy neckbeard ratchet. There was even brief talk of using the PS3's hardware for things like procedurally generated platforming challenges, freeform space exploration, all of these new ideas to utilize the stronger hardware, which they quickly realized wouldn't be possible if the game was going to come out in 2007 as planned. Instead, they focused their ambitions away from new mechanics, even stripping back features that would be hard to recreate from the old PS2 days like the spherical moons or races, and they shifted gears towards a leaner, more polished core gameplay experience with a more fleshed out narrative to follow shifting industry trends. It was during this time that creative director Brian Allgaier began shaping a larger multi-game story, ever so briefly alongside writer Adam Moore, who was replaced not long after that by TJ Fixman. Fixman would go on to write the rest of the PS3 games, the first draft of the Ratchet & Clank film, the comics. He was tasked with unifying the universe and the lore wherever possible to make it easier for future Ratchet teams to tell new stories, and so on. And while they were hashing out what kind of plot the tentatively named Ratchet & Clank Future would be, the team outlined the game's broad scope, which would aim to be, far and away, the largest in the series, featuring 25 unique planets, 5 Star Fox-esque space combat levels, an hour of cinematics, and there were promises of co-op gameplay and some sort of online multiplayer made to Sony. Sony was allegedly especially interested in those last two, as the company was looking for more ways to flaunt the PlayStation Network in an attempt to catch up to the Xbox's stronger online offerings. Most of this didn't happen. With the exception of that procedural generation stuff, which was shelved really early on and later tested for 2009's A Crack in Time before, again, being shelved, the rest of these ideas were the plans at the end of pre-production, 11 months after first beginning proper work, and about 12 to 13 months after putting together that initial teaser. But by the time that Resistance had shipped, with another 70 full-time Insomniacs about to roll over to bring Tools of Destruction into full production, the pre-production staff had put together one planet out of 25. Kind of. It didn't really work, it crashed all the time, and only part of the level was really actually finished, so after a year they had an idea of what they were in for, and that ambitious outline was simply not going to happen within scope. 15 minutes of cinematic cutscenes, 9 planets, and 2 of those Star Fox space levels had to be scrapped before any work had ever begun on them, which in turn would feasibly require rewrites since that's a quarter of the game's cinematics and a lot more of its levels just… gone. And as for those co-op and multiplayer components, even though they were, according to one of the programmers that I spoke to, either never discussed with the programming team at all or were shot down immediately by that programming team because they would have pushed the game well out of scope, 
Somebody promised Sony that there would be a sick co-op mode and an awesome multiplayer mode that they could promote and slap on the back of the box. That didn't happen. Sony's representatives may or may not have been very annoyed, and somebody then promised to make it up to Sony for the promise that they made before. We'll get to that. The reason I mention all of this is that it's all crucial to understanding what Tools of Destruction became, what it sought out to become, and why every Ratchet game since exists either as a reaction to, or as a consequence of, this one. This wasn't just one game, this was the bellwether for a series that would continue to chug along even though it started to fall out of vogue as industry trends shifted. A series that would experiment out of a necessity to stay relevant. As was the mantra with the series up until this point, it's adapt or die, and Insomniac needed to keep changing so that Ratchet didn't go the way of the rest of the Lombaxes. As so many of you already know, those Lombaxes are the focal point of Tools of Destruction's story. As I mentioned in the Ratchet Deadlock retrospective, the team considered making antagonist Ace Hardlight a Lombax in that game to bring a more personal stake to the story, to heighten the drama during his interactions with Ratchet. But even that early on, it was decided that the Lombaxes should be a special plot point, one that could be better utilized as its own dedicated story rather than a throwaway story beat. Here in Tools of Destruction, that's exactly the story that we're getting. Except, you know, that 14 years later, we still haven't exactly seen that story finished, or, or really started. I'm not bitter, I swear. Ratchet & Clank Future opens with an excellent primer for our titular duo, introducing newcomers and reminding returning players of their characters and their relationship, as well as a reminder of our other major returning cast member, the ever-cowardly Captain Quark. Ratchet? Clank, I've uh, got a bit of a situation here at the Planetary Defense Center. As Ratchet and Clank are putting together a new hover bike, they receive a distress call from Quark. Across the city, Metropolis is under assault by an army of heavily armed robotic commandos. When aren't they heavily armed? After a fast-paced cutscene featuring the duo weaving through traffic at breakneck speeds, well, it wouldn't be a Ratchet game without the duo crashing a vehicle, now would it? It's that cutscene, the gorgeous opening view when we start playing, and really the tech showcase that is this Metropolis prologue that hammered home that, yes, Insomniac would definitely be able to keep dropping jaws like Sony expected after that first teaser. I mean, we've got whole buildings crumbling into rubble and collapsing behind you as the backdrop to these cinematic grind rail sections. We've got Ratchet bouncing all across the city as this mysterious invasion is in full swing. We've got our usual flippy jumping and shooting all in a crisp 60 frames per second that never chugs. It's no hyperbole to say that Tools immediately proves itself as the first game that shows what the PS3's hardware could really do. It's an incredible feat given that Tools of Destruction was made on half to two-thirds of the budget of other contemporary AAA games, and it's no coincidence that Rift Apart takes some clear cues from this game when it comes to starting your game with a high-octane city invasion to start us off. Once the duo fights their way to the Planetary Defense Center, they end up surrounded by the army and first encounter Tools of Destruction's main villain, Emperor Percival Tachyon. Tachyon is the last of the Kragmites, a violent species that warred with the Lombaxes for generations and generations, far away in the distant Polaris galaxy. And according to Tachyon, Ratchet is the last of the Lombaxes. Hello! Aren't you forgetting someone? Oops. <laughs> as the Emperor dispensed of the species in an act of revenge for his own species being wiped out. Immediately, after such a great opening level, we've got a really interesting parallel that we can see taking shape. The final two descendants of their species, two races that fought an endless war, an air of mystery as we might finally start getting answers to questions that fans had had about just who Ratchet actually was. But in what might be my least favorite trend throughout the Future Saga, these games can't decide whether they want to lean into the deeper narrative or break the tension with a joke at the expense of our villain. When in doubt, the Future Saga's writing takes away any heat from our villain without fail. In this case, it starts with a cute little callback to Clank's intimidating kung fu skills from Ratchet 1 onward, but immediately jumps to... I-I-I just... This goober single-handedly expelled the Lombaxes, and all it took was a kathunk of Ratchet's wrench to get past him and hijack his ship? Are you kidding me? Way to neuter your intimidating main villain immediately!
Our Grand Theft heroes take a lengthy nap thanks to the ship's cryosleep slash punch-out mode as the ship autopilots to the Polaris galaxy. Clank even has a concussed, clairvoyant dream where he's flying through a mysterious city with some weird little aliens, although he's awoken when the duo crash lands on the swampy planet Cobalia with no ship and no idea where they are. Even though I just called it Cobalia. They, they don't know that yet. Fuck you. Before we go any further, let me just get this out of the way. No, we're not going to talk in detail about Angela Cross. Yes, her being a Lombax threw a big, dumb, hilarious wrench in the whole where did the Lombaxes go story. It would have been infinitely easier to just say that this evil Emperor Tachyon hunted her down before Tools of Destruction began, or even a single line of dialogue where Ratchet and Clank wonder if Angela was far enough away that Tachyon didn't know about her. Or, hell, just say that she's not a Lombax. Problem solved. Why didn't they do that? It's still a vociferously debated subject to this day, to the point that in the Ratchet and Clank art book, all Insomniac really had to say about Angela was, we're really, really sorry to our fans about this one. Seriously, we mean it. Look, I'm gonna be real with you, It's that's fine, it's good enough for me. Like, half of the people that even worked on the future games had no hand in Ratchet 2, those that did have a hand in 2's story had to deal with Angela being rewritten several times because her characterization took forever to get remotely decent, I, I don't blame them for just either forgetting in a crunch-induced haze, we'll get there too, or ignoring her, it's not all that serious to me. Now, their explanation as to her whereabouts later in the future saga, different story, different day. One of the things that I love most about Tools of Destruction is that it doesn't only try to return to the platforming combat balance of the first two Ratchet games, which Up Your Arsenal and Deadlocked had started to inch away from in the name of more gunplay, it also returns to those earlier games' balance between futuristic sci-fi locales and the natural, wild unknown. Kabalia is a great blend of this, starting with a short trek through an undeveloped swamp as Ratchet and Clank fight some of the local fauna, like... A centipede whose acid vomit you can see flowing up through their gut before they spit on you. Alright, that's kind of uncomfortable to watch. I don't... I don't very much like that, but at least there's no way they can make anything more disgusting than that... Is that Munch from Oddworld? You know what? No, never mind. They made it worse. Can I get a taxi back to the Solana Galaxy, please? Tools of Destruction's attempt to translate one-to-one -one the Ratchet & Clank style from PS2 to PS3 is probably its clearest here, as the green, underdeveloped first level is a series trademark, especially if it's a swamp or jungle. You can see the pieces in just these opening steps where the team looked back at Ratchet 2's Uzla, or especially Florana from the third game. Then, once you've gotten a taste of one of the flying leviathan mini-boss enemies, the level opens up to showcase that vision that Insomniac wanted to push with those earlier games, but simply couldn't due to memory limitations. The second half of Kabalia features a bustling spaceport full of movement, with little robots floating across the walkways on their own little routes, a few optional paths for Ratchet to take, our first taste of the game's three, count them, three different vendors that are equal parts machine and living creature shouting at you to buy something, and our first of many interactions with the smuggler and his rowdy little parrot, who are, fun fact, both voiced by the same person. There's so much passive background motion in this little hub that it's kind of a shame that we're only here for a few minutes and only have a couple things to do. When Ratchet and Clank talk to the smuggler, he offers to trade a few minutes of their time for a ride off planet. Aw, oh, come now, sell their kidneys! I'll admit that these two characters might actually peak right here in the first cutscene they appear in. Although they end up being featured in just about all of the PS3 games after this, they don't really ever have much interesting to say or do. The smuggler is just kind of there on some planets, saying, yeah, what I'm doing is illegal, what about it? And giving you some flavor dialogue about some lore where they couldn't find better spots to toss in exposition. More often than not, he would serve as a stand-in for the plumber, offering to pay you in bolts for bringing him crystals or the game's equivalent to crystals. In this game, those are Leviathan souls. In one of the later games, it's just straight up the ivory from a monster's horn. They don't even try and hide it. Occasionally, the smuggler will also act as the capitalism paywall, which also returns from Ratchet & Clank 1 and 2, selling you an item that he illegally obtained, which you conveniently need at exactly that moment to progress in the level. For as often as he's featured, uh, I don't know, overall he's not really a super interesting supporting cast member as much as they really try to make him a thing, which is something you'll be hearing a lot today. 
Anyway, in exchange for giving Ratchet and Clank a ride off the planet, the smuggler gives the duo a Gelinator gadget and asks them to reactivate the port's gelatonium plant. The Gelinator is a personal favorite gimmick of mine, one that I'm always a little disappointed never got to return. This gadget is sort of like Ratchet 1's Hydro Displacer, sucking up gelatonium from the marked dispensaries, but once you have gelatonium, you can shoot out little bouncy gel pads anywhere in the level, at least until you have to deposit the gel. When you jump on the gel, you'll get an extra high vertical bounce that you can use to leap over large gaps, find hidden secret areas. Hell, in some areas, the game never actually makes you deposit the gel at all in order to progress, meaning that you can just mess around and find ways to break the game or get out of bounds. Pretty much every time the game makes me use the Gelinator, I'll go out of my way to see if I can bypass the game's intended path. Why use a gravity boot walkway when it's faster to just bounce right over it? It's such a fun, simple little gimmick that brings me endless joy. Before we leave Kabalia with the Smuggler, though, let's take a look at those vendors. Here in Polaris, rather than returning the Gadgetron or Megacorp, there's a new weapons monopoly in town, and that's Grummelneck. This company's defining feature is that it's run by the last Grummel in existence, the final of his species, just like Ratchet and Tachyon, now that I think about it. Whatever, the dude just cloned himself thousands of times to make them run the different vendor shops, with the clones getting dumber with each new generation. It's not really important, I just kind of really like that detail. Tools of Destruction naturally brings back the distinct weapons and armor vendors from the previous games, and it also introduces a third vendor and a new subtype of weapon, the device. Throughout the game, you'll unlock the ability to buy up to eight different devices, a set of secondary weapons that can't earn experience or level up, but do provide a more passive or less traditionally useful effect. These include a morph bomb that'll turn enemies into penguins, a helicopter drone, two different leech bombs that let you sap health away from enemies, a bomb that'll set enemies to attack one another, a... a death slinky? And of course, the two standouts that you all know and maybe still love, the Groovatron and Mr. Zircon. The latter is a floating companion robot in the vein of Ratchet 2's Synthenoids, who will follow you around and shoot at enemies. Zircon, of course, goes above and beyond by trash-talking the entire time with awful deadpan jokes, puns, and insults in his monotone robot voice. Look, I'll say it, I love Zircon. He's so ridiculous, and even if he ended up being a bit overexposed because he's appeared in almost every game since, generally they've made it work by either adding in new lines or twists to his gimmick. And although I already detailed that the Groovatron was one of the game's first suggested gadgets, what I haven't mentioned was that that suggestion came because of a damn good reason. When the idea for a dancing weapon was tossed out as far back as the second Ratchet & Clank game, it would have been an overwhelming task for the animation team to add one or multiple unique dance animations for each and every type of enemy in the game. However, the animators were now coming off of the heels of Resistance, a game where they had to animate dozens of different poses to account for any and every possible turning motion that the enemies could have. I'm talking a 45 degree turn to the left, a 30 degree turn right, a 270 degree turn clockwise, okay now one counterclockwise, okay now one where the enemy steps backward and turns 180. It's the kind of mind-numbing work that needs to be done, but that not many people are thrilled doing for 8 hours a day for months on end. So when somebody brought back the idea of giving a bunch of stupid dancing animations, that apparently was a vacation compared to the Resistance grunt work. And you can tell that the animators had fun because the animations are so fun. Both the Groovatron and Zircon were upgraded from devices to full weapons and have returned in almost every game since. They've become the most transcendent weapons in the franchise, with the Groovatron at one point being used against you as a boss weapon, and Zircon has a whole ass family and they're recurring characters rather than just a weapon, and that's perfect. Meanwhile, none of the other devices or the pure concept of devices made it past this game. They were a cool idea, but it turns out that leveling up the weapons as you use them is kind of important, who would have thought? And having some B-list weapons that were mostly secondary effects that regular weapons used to have before, like health leeching, yeah, not super popular. Hey, credit for creativity, I suppose. And you know what? I still think they should bring back the Death Slinky one day. I would like that very much. Tools of Destruction's items in general run into an interesting territory, because quite a few of them are just thrown at you as random pickups in the middle of a level. Now, Ratchet's no stranger to randomly finding a new shiny thing out in the field, but usually in the past, it would be at the end of an optional route like the Morpho Ray. But here in Tools, they'll just be floating in the middle or the start of a bustling city, like in our next level, Stratus City. 
The smuggler ejects the duo from his ship when the Emperor's forces detect a Lombax pulse on board, and mere moments after landing on the ground, Ratchet finds the Shock Ravager, a whip weapon, just sitting right at the start of a bridge. There's no fanfare at all, no unique inspired little cutscene when Ratchet picks it up, it just kind of happens. And it's really weird because even the really uninspired Gold Bolt pickup animation in this game has the classic fanfare. I, I don't know, it just kind of feels a little bit off, like you got an item for the sake of getting it. Strata City, aside from this weird little hiccup, is a blast of a level to run through. Another large-scale, city-wide battle in the same vein as the opening, featuring Ratchet swinging through traffic with the swing shot, among other things. This is also where we get a more proper look at Tachyon's army of Drophids, these little fish creatures armed in giant robot suits. I've always had a soft spot for Drophids as enemies, because not only are there a good number of suit types that you'll go up against throughout the game, most of them when defeated will feature that little fishbowl helmet cracking open and shooting the Drophid out onto the ground, where Ratchet can then squish them by stepping on them. No, I'm not a sociopath, thank you for asking. Strata City's got a little bit of everything too, with some gelatonium platforming that allows you to just totally break the game like I mentioned earlier. This may or may not be how I discovered that the missiles crashing onto the rooftops of buildings nearby? Yeah, those are real, and they will hurt you. After fighting their way through the city, Clank sees those little alien creatures again, pointing towards the Hall of Knowledge. Ratchet, though, doesn't see whatever it is that Clank's seeing, but these little guys are definitely real because they modify Clank with a glider upgrade. Yet again, you can see the game's inspiration on its sleeve, because the glider is a callback to Ratchet 2's glider, although, at least in that game, this gadget didn't need motion controls. Ah, the mid-2000s. What an innocent era. Some of you may recall that in the early 2000s, Sony and Microsoft were both taken to court by a company named Immersion, the company that owned the patent for the vibration technology used in both the PlayStation and Xbox controllers. Microsoft immediately settled up and bought stake in that company, but Sony decided to drag the lawsuit out, which led to them paying close to $100 million, and in a totally unrelated move they promise, the early PS3 controllers replaced the gimmick of DualShock Vibration with the even more gimmicky 6-axis motion controls. As an early PS3 title, you can be damn sure that Tools of Destruction had to make use of these gimmicky gyro controls. Thankfully, they're not super invasive, and you can turn them off, but they're certainly here, and they are here often. To name just a few uses of the gyro controls, we've got these glider sections, the game's hacker gadget, which is a combination of a gyro ball puzzle and completing an electrical circuit challenge, the dancing pirate hollow guys, which requires you to occasionally shake the controller to shake your booty, and one of the weapons that you can buy in the game, the tornado launcher, which we'll talk about a little bit later. After infiltrating the Hall of Knowledge and taking down an onslaught of Tachyon's troops, the duo obtains the coordinates to the Lombax's original homeworld, Fastoon. And with more troops on the way, they rush into a nearby escape pod and head right to that planet. When they land, though, Ratchet discovers that the planet has long since been abandoned. The only remnant left of Ratchet's species, of his family, is a damaged Lombax ship. Clank, please. I need to fix her. Perhaps some of this is down to preference, but where Tools of Destruction really nails those bigger set-piece moments and bringing some awesome scope to the Ratchet & Clank series, there are just as many points where the game almost seems to expect the player to fill in the blanks. At no point prior to this game does Ratchet seem to have a huge interest in finding his family, and honestly, even in the first hour of the game up to now, that still holds true. The Smuggler gives us a bit of backstory on the way to Strata City, telling Ratchet that the Lombaxes vaporized the entire Kragmite species before Tachyon wiped them out and took over the galaxy, but Ratchet himself doesn't actually respond to this at all. It feels like a sudden jump here for Ratchet to have a deeper attachment to his species, to his past, and it's a leap that could have been easily smoothed over with even a little bit of dialogue sprinkled in throughout the first few levels. A comment of, I wonder what Tachyon meant when he said I was the last Lombax, some mid-gameplay dialogue between Ratchet and Clank, which Tool started introducing, anything like that could have gone a long way towards easing Ratchet into this moment here. Sometimes these smaller hiccups betray the big budget feel and show that, yeah, this game was operating on a tight timeline and a tighter budget, and as the sixth large scope big budget game in six years by this studio, eventually it had to catch up to Insomniac. 
The Shock Ravager just being given to you here at the very start of level 2, right after level 1 opened up with 3 purchasable weapons in the shop, as well as a few devices, plus the 2 weapons you start the game with, it feels off, like there was meant to be another level somewhere in here to sprinkle in the content more evenly. And the thing is, I know that's not the case, but that's how jagged Tools of Destruction's edges can be. Instead of some big moment that emphasizes the mystery and the intrigue surrounding the Lombax's disappearance, a level that gives us some environmental lore or storytelling, what we get is some basic ruins, a strange little collectathon style level as Ratchet and Clank seek out six components nearby to repair the ship. We don't get any sort of dialogue as they walk around, where Ratchet could, I don't know, ask Clank what else he read about the planet moments ago. It's like they're a few hours into a car ride and have nothing else to say. The only story beats we get here on what should be one of the most consequential planets in the entire first part of the story come at the end of the mission, and just before it when we get a taste of this game's Clank sections. The Clank gameplay is fundamentally pretty close to the PS2 game's Gadgetbots, but this time featuring the Zoni, those weird clairvoyant creatures that Clank's seen a couple times by now. I mean, I say there are story beats, but the Zoni talk in vague, prophetic codewords throughout the game, the kind of stuff that's only really decipherable during a second playthrough, and even then, it just tells you what's coming up a bit later on. It's never really a hint towards future games. The Zoni do at least have some neat powers compared to the Gadgetbots, allowing Clank to slow down time, fix bridges, attack enemies, or levitate so that we don't have to deal with his awful little jump like we did back on the PS2. But these sections tend to overstay their welcome even more so than the PS2 games Clank levels often did. They're just too long for what's fundamentally the same thing, still holding triangle and selecting the only available move for your minions to execute. But it's the end of level story stuff that I think really sours me on Fastoon the most looking back. After finding all of the parts, Ratchet fixes the Lombax ship, with a little musical flourish in the background that seems to reference the very first piece of music that we ever heard in Ratchet & Clank 1, back when Ratchet was on his other backwater desert homeworld putting together a ship. Okay, I think we have all the parts we need. It's a touching moment that passed me and probably thousands of others by the first time around, but since I'm playing these games in succession, it's not a stretch to say that it's an intentional nod by composer David Bergeaud in what would be his second-to-last soundtrack for the Ratchet series. But then once the ship is fixed, it's just Kit. The, the Knight Rider one, the car from Knight Rider. It's a sentient, talking, a little bit sassy spaceship to whom we then talk and ask questions in the dumb, over-the-shoulder flavor conversation camera angle. It's just, it's almost parody how funnily this shot comes off, but it very much feels like this ship named Aphelion is meant to be a proper character in the game, a way for Ratchet to reconnect with the species that he's never known. On one hand, I appreciate the kit part of it a little bit more with the context that writer TJ Fixman is apparently a huge Knight Rider nerd who's now writing a Knight Rider film. That's, you know what, I can't knock that part too much, I would probably do the same thing. But I can knock that the talking spaceship gimmick is then barely acknowledged again after this game. As far as I recall, Aphelion gets a grand total of 30 seconds of dialogue across the five subsequent games that she appears in. And all of that 30 seconds of dialogue is as a generic AI rather than one that contributes any substance or character at all. Now, of course, I cannot blame this game for actions that were taken in its sequels, but I can sure lament that this isn't the only time, nor is Aphelion the only character to whom this happens. And given that so much of those later games' production was dependent on the choices that were made and the things that were set up in this game, I feel obligated to point them out when they pop up. See, TJ Fixman, as I'll end up repeating many times throughout this retrospective and onward, was kind of dealt a rough hand based on my research. By his own admission, he took over writing duties after the levels and the cast were already designed and in many cases implemented into the game, animated, what have you. We've, as far as I've found, never gotten an indication of what the original Tools of Destruction writer Adam Moore had in mind. All we know is that he left and that Fixman, who had been working in Quality Assurance for Resistance, was given a chance thanks to his background in writing and some promising spec scripts. 
In other words, TJ Fixman was given the mother of all trials by fire, throwing together a story based on designs for villains and secondary characters that were already in place, with a handful of months and likely several hard deadlines left to get all of the dialogue finished and ready to record, all while writing a series bible to address all of the fan questions that Insomniac hadn't had time to address while throwing together the first four Ratchet games, year after year after year after year, and while setting up teasers for plot points or characters that he wanted to address himself in Ratchet & Clank Future 2. And at some point, he was also brought on to have a major hand in writing for Resistance 2, which was due out the following year after Tools in 2008. So between 2007 and 2009, on any given day, there was a strong chance that this guy was writing for two game projects at any given point. Between Tools of Destruction, Resistance 2, 2008's suddenly thrown together Future Saga Midquel Quest for Booty, and 2009's Ratchet & Clank Future 2. So while I can fully understand why any of these issues are present in any of the Future Saga games, and while it sort of comes down to the same overzealous production goals that the studio has always had, just this time it was hit harder due to the hardware jump, hiring issues, and other potential shortcomings. And as a result, we've had a, had a smoother production than any we've experienced at Insomniac. Despite all that, these are all still things that I must address to give you the most complete picture of this game, which heretofore not many folks have cared to do, be they journalists, YouTubers, anything, you name it, not many people have gone this deep into this game's production issues. Anyway, whatever her deal is, Aphelion gives you some basic lore if you want it, and then allows you to play a video sent to you by Captain Quirk, who's been forced to work with Tachyon as a promoter for the Emperor's Fight Festival. I'm gonna say that again. What we did here, all of our initial time on this planet that's suddenly meant to mean so much to Ratchet, boils down to an excuse to get a new spaceship so that we can jump into our next questionable distraction from the main story angle. And speaking of distractions and characters that TJ Fixman seems to have been saddled with, let me tell you a little story. I promise it's related. When I was in high school, I took Latin as my language class throughout all four years. Our professor's classroom was full of books written in Latin. Once we got into Latin 3, he would only speak and teach in Latin most of the time. It was a trip, to say the least. But the thing that sticks out in my mind most, even a decade later from these classes, wasn't learning how to fasten a toga. Yes, we did do that at one point. It wasn't learning what a gerund is, or about the Roman senator who ended every speech by saying that Carthage must be destroyed, although that one is close. It was a single quote among many that he had printed on pins, pins that he would give out to students to put on their backpacks or whatever. That quote was from the story of Apollonius, a possibly fictional king of the city of Tyre. This quote represented to the professor the point at which the story completely went off the rails, where the long since forgotten writer needed something to keep the plot going, something so ridiculous that one could argue that this was the point at which it was clear the story was likely fiction. That phrase, when translated into English, is loosely, and suddenly, some pirates arrived. Ahoy there, young scallywag! So in what I have to assume was originally an attempt to add a secondary antagonist to this game in the vein of the Thugs for Less leader from Ratchet 2, and suddenly, we've got pirates now, and the game makes zero attempt to explain why. We don't even get a moment where Ratchet scoffs and gets ready to fight the pirates like we've seen him do in the space combat levels in Ratchet & Clank 2. There's no debrief after where Clank says that this sector of the galaxy is clearly dangerous. They could have even just mentioned the space pirates in passing during conversations with the smuggler, especially since not too long after this, he tells us that he sells to those very same space pirates. But instead, it's just suddenly pirates. We just have to fight these space pirates in an on-rail space combat section unabashedly inspired by Star Fox. This is the first of three such space levels sprinkled throughout the game, and they're all pretty okay. I don't, I don't hate them or anything. They're not bad. They're just, again, very long, kind of like the Clank sections, and kind of boring compared to Star Fox. From what we know of how much time these sorts of gimmick levels took in earlier games, enough work to essentially design an entirely separate game, it makes sense, I get it, and I do appreciate that this game's space levels, according to some of the ex-Insomniacs I've spoken to, are the finished vision originally planned for and then cut from Ratchet 3. But I just... I just can't get over how suddenly these pirates show up, and how these levels are pretty much an excuse to feature the pirates more than they already are throughout Tools of Destruction. 
Now, far, far later in the game, there are a couple blink and you'll miss him hints as to why there are space pirates that play a focal point in this game's story, but I'm gonna call this one like I see it. These had to have been characters that were meant to play a huge role in original writer Adam Moore's vision for this game, a game that was originally going to be titled Ratchet & Clank Future Quest for Booty. I don't know this for sure, as Moore didn't respond to comment and Fixman wasn't available for comment when I reached out to them respectively, but there is no other feasible reason for these characters to exist, and I am going to die on that hill. Clearly, they became popular, as for some reason they reappeared throughout the rest of the future saga to the point that of all people, Rusty Pete, the meekly drunk second mate of this battalion, is one of the only characters from the franchise that returns in Rift Apart 14 years later. Undeniably, they're one of the best parts of Tools of Destruction as a video game, because the pirate levels tend to be some of the most fun, the most complete, and the most iconic levels in the game. Not really the space ones, but the times we fight them on the ground. One of these pirate levels, Ardolis, was clearly considered a high watermark for the entire Ratchet franchise, as the main path of that level was recreated nearly one-to-one -one in Rift Apart. But once you think about it, you have to wonder why they're actually here. If you miss the lyrics of one of the pirate chanties some of the random goons will sing, and unless you scroll down and select some hidden dialogue later in the game when talking to an all-knowing supercomputer, essentially Google, you would have no idea why they exist besides plot convenience. If you do catch either of those things, you'll learn that the Space Pirates were created by Emperor Tachyon himself in order to search for and bring him Lombax's technology. That's kind of an important plot point, but the closest we get to it being properly elucidated just involves them stealing a Lombax artifact for themselves, no mention of Tachyon. So we deal with these space pirates almost every other level, which takes away from the time that we're dealing with Tachyon and the empire that he's building. We barely deal with Tachyon to begin with, as for much of the game, he's sort of just a background presence. But unlike, say, Dr. Nefarious in Ratchet 3 or Drek in Ratchet 1, he is not one step ahead of our heroes every time. He's chasing the same goal at the same time as they are. On top of looking like he needs his widow diaper changed every time we see him in his stupid high chair, he's consistently neutered despite being what probably should be the most menacing villain in the Ratchet & Clank series thus far. This guy was smart enough, savvy enough, and powerful enough to wipe out the entire Lombax race, and we've seen what one Lombax can do, so imagine what it takes to take out the entire species. This guy should be the biggest of big bads that we've ever encountered, and yet we either barely deal with him, or when we do, we see him fumbling or falling over under the weight of his big fucking head. And then we also have to sprinkle in occasionally dealing with, speaking of big heads, Quark, or our secondary hero and Ratchet's eventual love interest, Talwin. There's just so much going on, and although this is the longest Ratchet & Clank game of the mainline series, besides All for One, it feels like there's too much going on, and it feels just bloated. Captain Quark serves nearly no purpose in Tools of Destruction. We see him a couple times at the Imperial Fight Festival where he clues us into some of what Tachyon is searching for, and to his credit, he does attempt some heroics at one point in his usual foolhardy way that causes more harm than good. But overall, it feels like he regresses after his character arc was basically completed by the end of Ratchet 3, and that has always sat wrong with me. If this were a true reboot rather than a soft starting point for new players, that could work. But in the context of the entire series, as written by a writer who even in 2007 name-dropped major PS2 characters like Skid McMarks and Sasha as important cast whom he wanted to use to tell new, expansive stories, for Quirk to fall back into being a feckless buffoon rather than being at least a somewhat self-aware buffoon, I don't know, it doesn't work for me. He's still really funny, and Jim Ward absolutely kills it in the role, as he always did. But it's this game that starts Quark's flanderization, where he starts to be defined solely by being a bumbling idiot, and that is a shame. We do get the return of his amazing hand-drawn plans, at least, so I guess I can't be too critical. Zord Doom Prison, a dangerous dungeon of dastardly denizens, death and destruction. A deadly den of devious desperados damaged by decades of de uh, uh, let's just say they're criminals. In order to meet Quark, Ratchet and Clank first must tackle the arena challenges, which I'll say in this game are 
fine, they're fine, they're all fun, but the arena design itself doesn't exactly translate well when brought from the PS2 to the PS3. It just kinda looks and feels smaller scale than the awesome Gladiator games with a ravenous bloodthirsty crowd and a high energy announcer, and the lava sitting around this arena's edge is just... it's just cheese. It doesn't even glow or look dangerous, it just looks like burnt cheese. Also, while in the arena, despite Tachyon's empire having the ability to detect Lombax DNA on apparently every ship coming into a planet, Ratchet can just wear funny mustache glasses and successfully disguise himself. It's... <sighs> it's just at every single turn they make Tachyon and his forces look like morons. It'd be amazing if it wasn't so sad. After Ratchet finishes some of these challenges, Quark passes along intel that Tachyon is looking for some mysterious Lombax secret, supposedly the superweapon that the Lombaxes had used to disintegrate the Kragmite race, and he's looking for it at the Apogee Space Station. This station was once the home of Max Apogee, an explorer who searched for the rarest, most interesting antiques in the entire galaxy, and despite being a key plot point throughout Tools of Destruction, after this game, he's completely tossed aside and barely ever mentioned again. We never meet Max at any point in any of these games, but we do meet his daughter here in this game, Talwin, as well as the two warbots that he left behind to protect her, named Kronk and Zephyr. Of these three, I, I like Talwin. I, I used to like Kronk and Zephyr a lot more, they're still okay, but the humor of old cranky grandpa robots hasn't exactly aged well for me. On the other hand, Tawin's story has aged far better over time, even though they've done her dirty in almost every game since. Her story being told in the background alongside Ratchet's, her holding onto the hope that her dad is still alive, the last family she had besides the two robots, it's another compelling fold to complement Ratchet's isolation from his own family. She's cold at first, having essentially not seen another living creature in years ever since her dad disappeared, but thanks in part to Clank, she warms up to Ratchet. Well, and also thanks to Ratchet being the very species about whom her dad was researching at the time that he went missing. Ratchet is the final clue that she has left, and she just so happens to have some of the clues that he needs as well. They both bond, implicitly because this is damn sure never outright said, around the fact that all they have as family are robots that are more human, well, you know what I mean, not exactly human, than anybody else that they've dealt with. They bond around becoming each other's only family left. She also receives probably the third or fourth most screen time in the game besides Ratchet, Clank, and maybe Slag, making her a clear tenant for the rest of the future saga to come, well, at least in theory. In practice, another story, another day. As for Kronk and Zephyr, I think they sort of fall into the same boat as the Pirates, where I feel that the development team enjoyed them more than many players did as time went on, which is totally fair, they need to have fun too. The main purpose for these robots is to act as battlefield allies in the same vein as Ratchet 3's Galactic Rangers, with their combat dialogue, and all their dialogue in general, really focusing around the two bickering about the good old days, remembering information wrong, telling taller and taller tales about walking uphill both ways to school, or about how Carthage must be destroyed. You want to know just how dated and poorly aged Kronk and Zephyr are today? They were designed to bicker like this because they each represent one side of the Xbox 360 PS3 console war. Zephyr's name is even a reference to the codename for one of the 360's models. And there are also references sprinkled in about their third brother, Willy, who liked to flail his arms around all the time. I happen to be a renowned expert in Lombax history, and this doohickey is a zombie death beam emitter that'll wipe out all life in the galaxy! Then <laughs> why are you trying to put batteries in it, you darn fool? Guys, just give me two seconds to think. And also like the pirates, these two very much feel like a holdover from the previous writer, from the previous version of Tools of Destruction, characters that were already going to be in this game no matter what since they had assets created and Insomniac really likes to hold firm to the use everything you ever make policy. But the problem is if something's not good or it's not working out super well or it's not meshing, it's okay to not finish it. This video that you're watching right now was me jumping to a new project after the one I had planned before wasn't working out well. 
Obviously, my projects are measured in hundreds of hours at most, not thousands and tens of thousands across hundreds of people. Obviously, I'm not as constrained by tight deadlines. Issues hiring enough staff to finish these games without crunching. We've had a, had a smoother production. Publisher requirements, etc. But that publisher is the entire reason that Ratchet & Clank exists, because they nudged Insomniac to scrap the PS2 game they were originally working on, because it was not working. It's not like Kronk and Zephyr are make or break to the plot, they don't ruin anything by being here, but it's emblematic of the game and the studio's apparent insistence at the time to never concede a point. And this is what it boils down to, there's always just a piece missing from Tools of Destruction to me, and that's coming from somebody who looks very fondly at this game. Like, let me say this loud and clear, I really enjoy Tools of Destruction as a game, I enjoy its story when I don't think about it too deeply. It's about as polished as Ratchet had ever felt up until this point, and because the journey was so focused gameplay-wise, despite it feeling a bit long in the tooth sometimes, it felt like the most complete complete Ratchet game at the time of its release, the combination of 2's exploration and 3's smoother experience and level up system that I wanted whenever I played either of those. And shit, I didn't play this game until about 2011 because I was too young to get a job at the time and the PS3 cost more than kidneys. I, for the longest time, compared this game to The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, two early 7th generation games with some iffy graphical slash stylistic choices that, although a bit bloated in length, ended up being, to me, the most complete and mechanically sound games and the underappreciated gems of Ratchet and & Clank and 3D Zelda respectively. They were never my favorite games in either series but their foundations were so rock solid that I couldn't find much room to knock either outside of some pacing issues. Now, whether I still feel that way about Twilight Princess today is another story for whenever I decide to give the Zelda games this sort of retrospective treatment. I've barely played that game in the last decade, so I don't know. But as for tools... I don't know, maybe you could say it's the new insight from all of my research. Maybe you could argue that it's doggedly comparing this game to the story beats it sets up for sequels to never pay off, again, we'll get there. But really, it's just that if you put this game under a microscope, it... it's fine. But you start to see the alarming number of cracks in the foundation. And as such, this is going to be the point where I'm going to perhaps start glossing over some of the game for the sake of time and preventing repetition. The game so often fails to get itself sorted, so I'm not going to extensively and exhaustively point out every detail that it messes up, because that doesn't accomplish anything other than tearing the game down, and that's not what I'm here for. That's neither fun nor constructive now that I've already expressed why the game ended up this way, and why that context is important to understanding the entire future saga, to breaking down the whole PlayStation 3 era of Ratchet critically, and then raising all of these games back up in the same no-punches-pulled manner that I did with the PlayStation 2 games. It just so happens that as these games started to take themselves a bit more seriously, they opened themselves up to more serious analysis, despite not being able to shine under that brighter spotlight that the games so desired to have. And also, frankly, I'm not going to go super into detail level by level because many of this game's levels don't say all that much story-wise. They're kind of, in an unintended callback to the first two games, just fun levels. While that may be in part due to late production scrambling, it works rather well to just take us back to that simple explorer vibe at which Ratchet & Clank's 1 and 2 excelled. The plot may start to matter a bit less as the game starts to feel like it's stringing you along just to give you an excuse to go from level to level, and you can definitely tell that the reasons to go to some of these planets get paper thin. But that's how the early games often were, so even though this game was attempting to be more than that, even when they missed, it kinda hit a different bullseye. There are many levels in Tools of Destruction about which I don't have much to say besides, yeah, they're fun. This is Ratchet & Clank gameplay done very well. Look, we're five games in here, folks. The wheel ain't getting polished much more than it already was. A level like the pirate base on Ardolis, for example, our next level after meeting Talwin and the robots, stands out because it excellently weaves an environmental story into the gameplay. For one, it's introduced in a neat and more importantly, organic way when the smuggler mentions the space pirates in passing when you talk to him. That is solid world building. If I'm gonna point out when the game trips, I've gotta give it some credit when it sticks a landing, and that's the kind of thing that should have been done to introduce these same pirates to begin with. 
This level is a fantastic combination of seedy pirate coves, damp caves, a massive scale war right on the pirate's home, right where they eat, sleep, drink grog, and probably dance. Definitely dance. Ardolis has a fun little side path that uses one of the game's new gadgets, this little helipod that raises platforms out of the water, lifts gates, and so on. It's not the most interesting gadget in the world, but it is one that often leads us down some of the more interesting paths aesthetically, like riding an actual pirate ship. Not to mention, this is a rare return of having a separate gadget-based path from a main combat path. We haven't seen that in a good while in the Ratchet & Clank series by this point. Even notwithstanding the cinematic journey through this pirate base itself, which is absolutely nothing to scoff at, the pirates themselves send several different types of troops at you, as if they're learning over the course of this massive battle exactly how to best deal with you. What starts as basic sword-wielding goons quickly escalates into the enemies blocking your heavy attacks with shields, forcing you to use some of your more situational weapons to try and hit them from behind. There are giant electrified pirates that are immune to your electricity-based weaponry. There's a mini-boss encounter that shoots cannonballs at you in a one-on-one -on -one fight where you can target specific parts of his body to do extra damage. And these guys are so pissed that you stole back Talwin's Lombax artifact from them that they chase you into space immediately afterwards and send their whole armada at you. At least until they realize they're late for their yoga class. There's a reason that so many levels throughout the rest of this franchise strive to be like Ardolis. There's a reason that we got a whole pirate game to try and capture the same magic, and it's because this level is just the complete package. Hell, even later in this game, the other pirate levels try to chase this same dragon, and although they're okay, they're not even close to as good as this one. Ardolis is such a good level that it makes you think the pirates might be more important to the plot than they actually are. They may end up being not much more than a minor nuisance, sure, but this final level gets you so invested in the fight against them and so invested in the vistas you may see while fighting against them that you'd almost rather Captain Slag be our final boss than Diaper Boy. And you can see exactly why Insomniac hung onto the pirates for as long as they did afterwards, even to this day, because, if nothing else, they make for an excellent opponent. And beyond just the spit shine of the gameplay mechanics, as I mentioned before, in my opinion, based on my multiple playthroughs of every game in the series, this is the longest Ratchet title besides All for One. And that's because where games like Going Commando and Up Your Arsenal did come close to matching the total game length, they had far more optional content, the same sort of content that was intentionally cut out of tools during pre-production. Besides the arena, there's no real side course to the main dish in the same way that those earlier games had things like large crystal hunting sandboxes or ranger missions. Tools of Destruction's nine or so hour adventure is almost entirely main plot, or rather critical path, whether it's all important plot-wise is again a different story and up to debate. So for a game that also aims to mostly recreate that PS2 magic without leaving the PS2 template too, too much, well, I've already talked in exhaustive detail about almost all of this game's mechanics before in those earlier retrospectives. The only difference here is that it feels a little bit slower sometimes, as in Ratchet himself literally feels a step or two slower in terms of movement speed, and he's running on much larger and longer levels. Ratchet feeling a bit slower is partly due to Insomniac shifting their gameplay programming from a frame-based system to what's called Delta Time. For many PS2 games such as Ratchet, every animation, walk cycle, etc. was designed so that it would look good both at 60 frames per second, but could also be quickly adjusted to fit the PAL region's 50 FPS without having to redo everything from scratch or just slowing the game down by 17% like, for example, Sonic. When it came time to rebuild everything on the more powerful PS3 hardware, though, the team aimed to avoid this issue by just using Delta Time, which would track the amount of time between frames rather than the frames themselves. So if there was ever a slowdown or some regional frame rate changes, those no longer needed to be handled by hand as far as animations would go. But as former Insomniac programmer Mu Yu told me, not everything was directly transferable, and so it took a long time to get everything feeling rather close. The result in Tools of Destruction is a game that ever so slightly feels like you're running through ankle-high water much of the time. 
it's not a thing you'd necessarily notice unless you're playing these games back to back to back to back to back as I have, but allegedly at least a few of this game's 16,000 logged bug reports were QA testers complaining that the game didn't feel the same as the good old days. So if you did notice, you're probably in good company. Speaking of bugs and things that don't feel good, our next planet after Ardolis is called Riken 5, a planet home to a lava refinery, whatever that is, as well as our first real fight against Emperor Tachyon's troops since around the start of the game. Well, not counting the arena, but he didn't know it was us, so I'm not gonna count it either. Alongside Kronk and Zephyr, Ratchet clears the battlefield of hordes of Drophid soldiers searching for the Lombax secret, before buying a gyro cycle from the smuggler in order to find a path through to that very same secret. Now the phrase gyro cycle should inspire terror knowing that this game has motion controls, and that's for good reason. This super monkey ball power-up initially was going to use the six-axis motion, but Insomniac eventually, thank god, had a change of heart and realized that this dumb hamster ball should at least be a little bit fun to control. That simply wasn't happening with Gyro, not in 2007. The gyrocycle areas are fun, if forgettable, but I'll take them over another six-axis gimmick any day of the year. But aside from the occasional six-axis controls and other new features like the over-the-shoulder zoom that complements the usual strength buttons, this is exactly what it sets out to be. The PS2 games, but more. You can see that the team called back to so many facets of the first four Ratchet & Clank games, from tiny things like the little bomb seeker bots being reimagined from Ratchet 1, to the aforementioned glider, the charge boots, to Ratchet 3's jackpot crates, to the cameos and callbacks throughout the story. Riken 5 is another good example of this, with a wide-open battlefield calling back to Up Your Arsenal's Ranger battles at least a smidge. Kronk and Zephyr talking about old wars and events brings back the same energy that the Rangers themselves did, too. Tools of Destruction's weapons are mostly beefed-up revisions of things we've seen in the past. Your blaster, shotgun, bomb glove, turret, rocket launcher, they're all here. We have a whip weapon just like we did in Ratchet 3, and we've got the new Razor Claws to add to the melee arsenal. These things will start glowing from yellow to red as you land hits on enemies, leading to more damage and a faster attack speed. They could even do a dive kick, or break the game by climbing walls if you know what you're doing. We've also got the Buzz Blades, a faster replacement for Ratchet 3's Disc Blade Gun, which by the time you buy it will take over as the rapid-fire pistol-type weapon for the Combustor, which will long have since been outclassed thanks to the enemy armor scaling. The Predator Launcher sort of acts in the same way that the Tempest did in Ratchet 3 as well, although here it's on the weaker side, so I don't tend to use it too, too much. You can really tell that this game's main arsenal was just a greatest hits of the PS2 guns by now, huh? Well, let's keep it going then. There's a flamethrower too, and the plasma beasts are just a gooier glove of doom, dropping the titular beasts on the ground to tackle any enemy that comes into their attack range. Really then, the only new guns besides the Rhino are the Razor Claws that I mentioned earlier, the Magnet Launcher which traps enemies in place via an electric net, and the Tornado Launcher which, if you really think about it, is just Ratchet 2's hover bomb gun but more useful since you can move around while controlling the projectile's path. The 6-axis motion controls on this thing are super finicky, so I don't actually recommend using it while moving, but if you set up shop somewhere safe and rain the tornadoes down onto your foes from a distance, you'll see just how powerful and visually impressive this thing is as it ragdolls enemies, crates, even pieces of terrain, anything in its path, just like, you know, a real tornado. And then finally, there's the Alpha Disruptor, which shares a similar functionality to the Spartan Laser introduced in Halo 3 a month before this game came out. At first, you might even think that this Spartan laser is one of the Lombax secrets that the game keeps teasing because of how powerful it is, and because it's a Lombax weapon found at a Lombax testing facility, where the duo is led to believe the big Lombax secret was hidden. According to a long-lost tape they found, the big Lombax secret is a device called the Dimensionator, a gadget that the Lombax has built not to disintegrate the Kragmites and save the galaxy, but to send those Kragmites to another dimension entirely and peacefully exile them. Talwin is supposed to meet the duo at this testing facility, but I guess she hits some traffic because we never see her. Instead, we do see the plumber, who returns here on the PS3 as some sort of omniscient god figure. He cryptically tells our duo that the weapon they're looking for doesn't exist, which I just spoiled because I already explained what the Dimensionator actually does, I, I don't care, and then he throws them Chekhov's hexagonal washer, which they definitely won't need later to fix something, before flushing himself down a toilet. 
Yeah, you know what? I'd rather have the Spartan laser anyway. Hell, give me a couple more of those penguin morph bombs or the confusion gas. I don't even care that their effects reused from some of the PS2 game's weapons. It's better than a washer that's been marinating in the plumber's toilet bath water. Speaking of, at first you might wonder why those effects were moved over to devices rather than kept as weapon effects like the usual upgradable morph gun or Ratchet 3's Infector, or why these weren't just effects attachable to any weapon like in Deadlocked before it. In this case, hindsight's 2020, because they definitely should have just made the best devices into dedicated actual upgradable weapons and let you attach the other one's effects to any gun that you used. Deadlock's system was fantastic, although I guess maybe it was too complex for a first game for possibly new players. But really, it's more so because Tools of Destruction introduced a secondary upgrade system for weapons using Raritanium. Raritanium returns in tools as a not rare at all secondary currency like in Going Commando before it, but this time, the Raritanium you obtain from killing some enemies or finding treasure chests sprinkled throughout most of the game's levels is used in an upgrade tree for each individual weapon. So, on top of earning experience for the weapons and leveling them up by damaging enemies, you can spend Raritanium to upgrade things like Rate of Fire, Max Ammo Count, or even unlock special weapon-specific upgrades. For the Predator Launcher, you can gain the ability to lock onto a single baddie multiple times, which makes that thing instantly a little bit more useful. The Buzz Blades will stick into an enemy and explode when they can't bounce any more times, and the Spartan Laser just becomes Rift Apart's Negatron Collider when upgraded, phasing through enemies and damaging everybody in its path. Okay, look, I'm gonna say it. With how much clear inspiration Rift Apart took from Tools of Destruction and how many little nods there are, I'm not crazy for thinking that there might be a remaster in the works for the series' 20th anniversary next year, am I? Although the Raritanium system may not be as malleable or really as fun as Deadlock's stellar weapon customization, having a secondary currency in this game serves a good purpose. And that purpose is encouraging exploration. With these bigger, or more often longer levels more specifically, there are a lot of new corners and coves that curious players might find, and rather than just giving out bolts or having to go overboard hiding gold bolts or other collectibles in every single nook and cranny, Raritanium is the perfect bonus to keep players wanting to dig around. Although it's not exactly rare, you're never going to have more than you need during your first playthrough, so finding it is always a benefit, where bolts might have just been held in Ratchet's pocket forever. Plus, it's so damn satisfying to fill out these weapon trees, and that's definitely a part of why the upgrade trees have returned in multiple games since. To me, it's more satisfying than using this game's underwhelming Rhino. In Tools of Destruction onward, rather than buying the Rhino for an absurd price like we had in the past, Insomniac gave us a different route. And that's a good thing, because the economy is kind of broken in this game anyway. By the time you get the challenge mode, you can earn a hundred thousand to a million bolts from a single crate stack. From Tools of Destruction onward, except for All for One, because again, that game is a weird case, the Rhino is now obtained specifically by finding all of the gun's schematics, a new type of collectible that's hidden throughout the game. This actually means that you can get the Rhino in most games henceforth without having to beat the game or grind for bolts, although if you don't happen to dig around and find them on your first pass through each level, you're gonna have to backtrack later and deal with the long PS3 Blu-ray load times. One of the coolest things that Tools does, by the way, is that it preloads what should be your next level to skip as much of the load as possible, and if you ever have to go out of order, you'll appreciate that little under-the-hood trick even more, because it saves you a lot of time. Once you obtain every last Rhino Hollow Plan and bring them to the Smuggler, he'll make you the Rhino 4 for free, in exchange for letting him keep the schematic for future use, of course. In the case of the Rhino 4 here, it's... I don't know, it's not super satisfying to use. It kills everything, but at first it's missing that extra oomph. It feels more powerful than it actually is. I wonder what it might need. Now is also a good time to mention this game's weird scaling, since I just mentioned the bolt inflation. Like in Ratchet and Clank's 2 and 3, purchasable armor upgrades return in Tools of Destruction, although this time you can't actually see if there's another armor upgrade available beyond the one first on the list, so you have to buy all the armors in order. The thing is, though, enemies don't deal damage in a way that feels fair. Ratchet can upgrade his health to a whopping 999 maximum across several challenge mode runs, of course, but Ratchet takes damage as a proportion of his health rather than a set value like previous games had gone for. So even with the final challenge mode exclusive armor that allegedly absorbs 65% of all damage you take, by the time you get that armor, regardless of your max health value, you're going to die in 2-3 to three hits from most attacks anyway. 
This can make it one of the more challenging Ratchet games to beat in challenge mode, if not for the ammo vendors refilling your health the moment you access them. Yeah, so not only does this game generally have a pretty forgiving checkpoint system likely to avoid those PS3 load times if you went back too far upon deaths, anytime you have a vendor nearby, you can just keep running back and forth to top off your health for free. On one hand, this is a good way to counter the fact that the enemies you fought in the game's opening now cheaply do hundreds of hits of damage to you despite being the exact same enemy. On the other, it's also a really game-breaking mechanic once you realize it's there. The checkpoints are already so forgiving, so there's no real reason to make the tougher fights trivial in this way. I would much rather have had enemies that deal damage in a more fair manner than see the team create a new problem and then a haphazard solution to it that's also kind of a problem like this. Even if the game just charged you for health refills or something, it would be better than what we have here. Back to our main story here, Captain Quirk calls to tell Ratchet and Clank about the Iris supercomputer, a computer so powerful that it clearly has to know just about everything about the Lombaxes, the Dimensionator's location, Max Apogee maybe, so hopefully it'll be less cryptic than the plumber was. No, no, the supercomputer isn't super helpful at all. It shuts down the moment we try to get any answers of substance. I mean, it's just a power issue, so Ratchet absolutely could come back at any point in the future and ask about what happened to the Lombaxes, or what dimension they're in, or how to get there, but for some reason he never does that later in the series. In fairness, it's because he decides by that point in time that he's fine with Clank and Talwin being his entire family, but like, I think Talwin still wants to see your dad. They could at any point go back and ask the computer exactly what happened to Max Apogee and just close that plot point entirely. It would be a lot less messy a way to get answers than fluff dialogue in an in-game radio program or waiting for a comic series that only exists to retcon another plot point before doing it. While we're watching these games tell their stories by the seat of their pants, remember how Talwin was stuck in traffic or something and never met up with the duo back at that Lombax facility? They don't exactly say it, but she was captured by Tachyon's army and taken to the inescapable Zordum prison. Our heroes only learn this because the Zoni conveniently beam another vision into Clank's head while he's plugging the computer back in. Thanks to Quark's brilliant plan and certainly nothing else, Ratchet and Clank help Talwin escape from that inescapable prison in record time, but not before Ratchet is kind of a dick to Clank for the first time since Ratchet won. You know, Clank, just once, I wish you'd listen to your real friends instead of your imaginary ones. Yeah, so throughout the game, whenever Clank references his contact with the Zoni, Ratchet doubts him, he doubts their existence, and eventually, he's clearly so preoccupied with his own goal to find the Dimensionator and hopefully his family or any answers, that his frustration boils over and he just doesn't care to believe what Clank's saying. He forgets that Clank is always right. I mean, he still does kind of listen. He does go to Zordum at Clank's insistence, but only because they have no idea where the next planet's coordinates are after this. They don't know where to go, and they only get those coordinates after freeing Talwin, who then goes off to save Kronk and Zephyr off-screen as you finish the rest of the level yourself, which, by the way, is a really satisfying way to end a high-octane prison break. Just let someone else do it for you. Good, good, good game design. From here, Ratchet and Clank head to the homeworld of the Kirchu, a violent species that apparently almost all life in the universe is allergic to, which is part of the reason that Max Apogee, yeah, remember him, hid the Dimensionator here on this planet. But not before our final Star Fox level, as the space pirates chase our heroes through the event horizon of a black hole and even into the black hole itself. What a way to show the pirates' determination and to keep them feeling badass even if Ratchet delivers a dismissive, almost bored line before fighting them. This dude is really starting to annoy me. Way to take the edge off of what would otherwise be an awesome moment, jeez. This level was the first one designed for Tools of Destruction, and given its great blend of exploration-focused puzzle levels, varied combat setups against space pirates, the new Kirchu enemies, and even three-way fights involving both factions at once, and a set-piece-laden boss fight, you can definitely tell that this was meant to be the showcase of the game. After defeating the Kirchu boss defending the Dimensionator, we get our big blow-off with Captain Slag and the Pirates, which, again, feels more consequential and meaningful than most of our interactions with the main villain. For one, Ratchet and Clank don't just stand there when they could have fought back, like they do when Tachyon later in the game activates the Dimensionator. Instead, Slag, Rusty Pete, and the rest of the pirates are proactive. They grab and threaten to behead Clank, forcing the duo to let them grab the Dimensionator and escape. 
And in classic Ratchet fashion, the next level is our big difficulty spike, further driving home, to me at least, that Tachyon really does play second fiddle in his own game. This level isn't quite as polished as Ardolis was, it's not the complete package, but it could very easily have been the final level with how much the game throws at you. We've got multiple mini-boss fights, including a sort of naval battle against some of Slag's pirate ships flying through the sky. There's a dark, ominous atmosphere permeating the level. We've got a mix of tight, claustrophobic corridors and wide-open arenas for constantly shifting fight strategies. Composer David Bergeaud kills it with a driving, bombastic score, one of the strongest tracks in the game, maybe the strongest of both of his PS3 Ratchet scores before the studio tried going in a different, more cinematic musical direction. And of course, ending in a massive fight against Slag himself. It's to the point that this three-level run of Space Pirate Battles feels like the true mechanical climax of the game. After this, it's mostly basic fights and the game rushing to pay off the story that it's forgotten about half the time. Once Slag's defeated, Rusty Pete names Ratchet the new captain, although Ratchet sort of passes. But while he and Clank are arguing over the ethics of using the Dimensionator, a device with the ability to rip holes in the multiverse, a power that Clank argues should never be used, another captain shows up. In his attempt to be a hero, Captain Quark takes the Dimensionator and departs in an escape pod that heads right to the nearest planet, which is the Kragmite homeworld, the home of Tachyon's extinct species. Essentially, Quark just walks the thing right to the villain by accident. This is part of why the final few levels don't come close to the one that we just finished. Tachyon actually failed upward the entire time. He didn't accomplish anything, which I guess makes him the most relatable boss? He could have pulled the supervillain trope of showing up right here to steal it himself, the very same thing that Slag did just a level ago, and that would have felt better than Quark fumbling his way right to our idiot bad guy. I guess it still checks out that Quark is arguably the most dangerous guy in any given galaxy, since he helped Drek destroy dozens of planets. He almost destroyed an entire galaxy in the name of repairing his reputation. His bullying is directly responsible for Dr. Nefarious' evil ways, and he's done more to establish Tachyon as a real opponent than the Emperor himself. You can just tell the wheels are off the ride at this point, since after several levels of Talwin and the robots not being a presence, they're suddenly roped back into the fold here, another sign of the game juggling way too many balls at once. Again, by the way, it's pretty funny how clearly Kronk and Zephyr are just Galactic Ranger stand-ins, because we pretty much only see them on a wide-open battlefield right after a Halo jump. That's actually not a dig, though. I'm being genuine here. I know some players found Tools of Destruction too safe, but I actually appreciate how much of it is adapted wholesale from the earlier games. The battle itself is super bland, though. It's just a couple consecutive waves of Drophid Troopers while Talwin tells you that she's helping find a way to Quark while not actually doing anything, before ending with Comic Relief Villain failing to use the big dangerous device we've been told to fear the entire game. <laughs> to rise again! In any other game, the Dimensionator being a goofy device would be fine, but Tachyon has had no wins whatsoever throughout the entire game, and this is his only real major win, and he still gets made out to be a joke. The power of the Dimensionator's blast knocks Ratchet out, and in a callback to Ratchet 1, knocks the duo off of a cliffside, with Clank hanging on for dear life for the both of them. This time, though, our heroes are separated as they fall into the abyss, only to be reunited like 10 minutes later. But hey, it, it's something. It, there was an attempt. The Kragmites, I will say, live up to the reputation and the legend that the game gives them. These guys don't necessarily take the most hits to defeat, but they phase around the battlefield constantly, making them nearly impossible to hit with many guns. You've really got to focus your shots around one of these guys at a time just to get hits in, and so that you don't get overwhelmed by their often heavy numbers. The Kragmites are one of my favorite enemies to fight in this game, in part because of another great play that was taken from Ratchet 1. They're introduced in the same level as the weapon that's most effective against them, the Magnet Launcher. The easiest way to stop the Kragmites in their tracks is by trapping them in one of the nets, as they can't phase away when stunlocked, and this alone makes this gun one of my personal favorites in the game, really one of my personal favorites of any of the series' more situational weapons, because they actually for once give you good situations in which to use it. I'll also give credit where it's due, the game does a good job of balancing the weapon experience as well. Even though it frontloads itself by giving you so many weapons at once so early on, it's not like I was maxed out well before the end of the game. 
All the weapon level ups felt gradual, and outside of maybe the combustor pistol, not many weapons get classed out entirely by the end of the game due to being too weak for the enemy health scaling. I do wish we still had those help desk pop-ups when your weapons hit level 5 and evolved into an entirely new weapon, though. It sort of lacks the flourish and the impact in this game when you're not told what the upgraded weapons actually do differently. It's not a huge deal or anything, but it's this sort of small touch that most of the Ratchet games since have actually lost, presumably as much of the old guard has moved on to different companies or left the industry, leaving newer, younger teams that might not think about something like that. After reuniting with Talwin, Kronk, and Zephyr, a despondent Ratchet finally says the thing that I've been trying to tell you throughout this whole series, Clank is always right. Remember that. This cutscene here may as well be the only thing that's actually taken and properly developed throughout the rest of the future saga. We get Ratchet remembering that Clank knows best. When Clank shows up a moment later because this game doesn't let anything breathe despite being nine hours long, we get to see the duo about to bro-hug before they get self-conscious because Talwin is staring at them. Outside of, like, one more scene at the end of the game, the rest of this game's story could just be tossed away, which, on one hand, is kinda sad, but on the other hand, the payoff that Kraken Time delivers on these moments is pretty worth it. If Tools of Destruction, and really the entire future saga, does one thing well, it's bookending itself. For example, in the penultimate level with the Kragmites in tow, Tachyon invades the galactic capital in Meridian City. If you're wondering why he doesn't already have control of the capital, this is the capital of the galaxy's last major resistance to the Empire. The game doesn't ever tell you that. Fighting the Kragmites throughout this city and seeing the wanton destruction they leave in their wake does a better job of showing you just how dangerous the Kragmites are than the game has ever tried to tell you. And that's how it should be, really. The game needed this level to drive home that Tachyon is kind of dangerous, because we don't ever really get that sense from the rest of the game, given that we only actually fight his army every three levels on average. Up until this final rush to the finish, Tools of Destruction pretty evenly cycles between levels featuring Tachyon's troops, the pirates, and miscellaneous endemic creatures on abandoned or isolated planets like Kabalia, Fastoon, and Sargasso. Again, sure, if you pay super deep attention to the lore that's never directly mentioned in the main story, the whole game is Tachyon's doing under the hood since the pirates were his invention before they went rogue years ago. But until this last few levels, we genuinely spend more time and endure more levels fighting the space pirates than we do dealing with our main villain's army. As well as this game bookends itself with references back to the start, such as this city-wide battle, the final fight's callback to Ratchet and Clank being shot out of the smuggler's cargo ship, Ratchet coming around to trusting Clank when he mentions the Zoni, Clank waking up Ratchet at the end of the game in the same way Ratchet did to Clank at the start. As much as all these things are done well as bookends, the game misses the layups when it comes to tying our path from start to finish together in a meaningful way. Perhaps the idea of tying the pirates to Tachyon was itself a last-minute decision, and that's why it's never mentioned in the cutscenes and only in flavor dialogue. It would make sense, but it's a shame that it had to be that way. Hell, even partway into the final battle, after Tachyon and the Kragmites push to destroy Fastoon, we still get this sort of haphazard storytelling. I'm guessing this cutscene here may have either come into the picture late into production, or earlier on before they had finalized Tachyon's ever-changing look, because it's really weird hearing Tachyon give his motivation for destroying the Lombaxes and hunting Ratchet down off-screen from a megaphone inside his dropship. This cinematic is framed in such a way to limit as much animation and lip-syncing as possible, so it would check out that this was probably a rather late inclusion. Once Ratchet, Clank, Kronk, Zephyr, and Talwin reach the inner ruins of the Lombax city, Tachyon gives the Lombax a choice. He opens a portal to the Lombax dimension, telling Ratchet that he'll spare him if he leaves, if he goes to be with his family. If I leave you with the Dimensionator, no one will be safe. Not the Lombaxes. Not my friends. I'm not going anywhere until it's destroyed. Our final battle starts here in the Court of Azimuth, but very quickly moves into an interdimensional plane thanks to the Dimensionator's power and Tachyon's... not power. I mean, I say that, but he's genuinely one of the tougher final bosses in the series if you don't use the Rhino. Dude's got all the hallmarks of a Ratchet final boss, with the Shockwave attack, a barrage of guided missiles that'll stick into the ground for a moment before they explode, small fodder enemies to distract you momentarily, and of course the guided tracking laser that in this game will usually stunlock you if it hits you, pretty much dooming you if you get hit by it once or at all. 
Thanks to how constant the barrage of attacks is, thanks to this small asteroid crumbling into smaller and smaller pieces as the fight progresses, and thanks, of course, to this game's enemies dealing damage as a percentage of your health rather than set values like I mentioned earlier, it can be a lot to deal with. And all things considered, it's pretty impressive that this fight never really shows signs of slowing down the game or cutting into the frame rate at all. Once you've whittled down Diaper Boy's health to nothing, Tachyon will spew some more nonsense about how he knows Ratchet's true name and his purpose in the galaxy, I am your father, or some crap like that. It doesn't really matter, he's a joke villain. He gets sucked into a dimensional rift, never to be seen again except for the end of the comics. With space and time ripping around them, Ratchet and Clank find that the Dimensionator has been broken. But Chekhov the plumber saves the day, because the exact thing needed to fix the device is that hexagonal washer that the plumber tossed the duo earlier in the game. Dimensionator, find home! Ratchet, are you all right? Uh, where? Where are we? We are home, Ratchet. Once the duo is safely back home, everybody lives happily ever after. Rusty Pete tries to give Captain Quirk some pirate lessons. This time, add an inappropriate snur. Arr, you saucy w <sighs> Kronk and Zephyr have a cosplay battle as Ratchet and Tachyon, and Clank gives Ratchet a pep talk about his purpose in life and his accomplishments before the worst decision this series has probably ever seen. This game ends on a cliffhanger, as the Zoni show themselves to everybody in the room for the first time. They kidnap Clank for a reason we weren't meant to discover for two more years, and the game ends with Ratchet and everybody else looking sad. But it's worse than that, because not only do cliffhangers not exactly work well for games where development times are so fluid and so far out in the future, a future that's always more uncertain than in other media, not only does this sap so much goodwill that players could have as they look forward to the next game, because now this whole adventure has been kind of a slap in the face, this sad cliffhanger moment as Ratchet's only family is taken from him is followed by the credits blasting Groovatron disco music. <laughs> It's so dissonant, I cannot believe that nobody stepped in to say, hey, maybe no, to any part of this last couple minutes. It's not that a cliffhanger couldn't have worked for this game either, it's that this is a bad cliffhanger. Rather than just sour a melancholy but mostly positive ending, the game could have played with the literal cliffhanger moment a few levels prior, where they teased Ratchet and Clank being separated during their fall off of the bridge. Rather than Ratchet for some reason just falling asleep from the blast, move that moment around a bit and save it for the end of the game after Tachyon's been defeated, but before they've used the Dimensionator to get back home. Have Ratchet realize that Clank is always right in the climax of the game, not before it. It'll have more impact here. Have Clank make some sort of heroic sacrifice that saves Ratchet at the cost of Clank himself falling off of that ledge into the abyss, only for him to be saved by the Zoni in plain sight and then teleported away, leaving Ratchet completely shattered that his friend is not only gone, he's gone for a reason that in Ratchet's eyes is his own fault. I just threw that together off the top of my head. There's room to pick it apart already, I can tell you for sure, but this is just one of countless examples of how this sort of endgame cliffhanger could play far better with the book ending that Fixman loved to set up from game to game. Let me be clear, as much as I understand how rough of a hand this dude was dealt during his time as a writer for the entire Ratchet franchise when he was there, I don't adore a lot of what he's done. I think he sometimes gets a bad rap when folks discuss the series online, but really, his fondness for setting up a quote or a moment early on in a game that's paid off near the closing moments is the best part of his Ratchet work in my opinion. Everything in the middle, more often than not, just ends up being fluff, if not worse. But a ton of this is undeniably due to the growing pains that came with the leap that many developers took into deeper, more serious storytelling around the start of the seventh console generation. Not too many studios were keen on producing stories that actually flowed between multiple titles rather than telling self-contained stories that advanced a more general plot thread, let alone games that were aimed at a younger audience like the Ratchet series had always been. 
Fewer still would dare to try such a story angle while playing from behind after scrapping one writer's work and bringing in another to try and throw something together on the fly, and even fewer still would put that level of trust in a younger guy who had, as far as I know, zero writing credits to his name when he took over. The fact that this story came together as relatively decently as it did despite all of this is a testament to TJ Fixman's ability to improvise, and of course even though he was the writer this wasn't all his doing. These ideas were certainly part of a more collaborative process with many members of the team. No one person can really take the credit for writing a good game story unless that person is the sole developer. Likewise, we can't throw the blame entirely on Fixman for the boneheaded cliffhanger, because that made it through hundreds of people. That was signed off on by Sony representatives. A lot of people thought that was a good idea, and that says so much more about how far game storytelling has come in the decade and a half since. And Fixman had the backing of the higher-ups at the studio like Brian Allgaier, the guy who seems to have had that original vision for a multi-game story arc to begin with. The guy who may very well have guided that story down the path it took as he was guiding Fixman through the story beats that perhaps were already decided for the writer, or as he was listed in some interviews, the co-writer. Putting its development aside, I want to say again that I do enjoy the game that is Ratchet & Clank Tools of Destruction. I enjoy the story even if a magnifying glass quickly rips the whole thing to shreds, and I enjoyed the game's grander scope and this setup of a wider, deeper story that promised to pay off down the road, even if it didn't pay off as well as I would have liked. But I can't put that development aside because it's a part of this game's DNA. Tools of Destruction isn't Tools of Destruction without the rushed story. It isn't Tools without the publisher being privately upset because Insomniac got a bit too overzealous during the early game pitch and overpromised. It isn't Tools without being responsible for the rest of the games in the future saga, the rest of that promised payoff being thrown together on the fly in the very same way that this game itself was, and really that the rest of the series had been before it anyway. For all the work that went into creating a series bible to avoid throwing these game stories together haphazardly, in my opinion, it took until Rift Apart for us to get a game that wasn't thrown together super haphazardly anyway. In that vein, not much changed from the PS2 to the PS3, huh? The main change was that the future saga promised more, and even though they delivered at about the same standard, the PS3 games often feel like less because of the expectations they set up and then missed, because ambition had to be measured in an era where games took longer and cost more to make while having to look even better than ever, because the studio continued giving itself only just enough time to squeak by rather than taking a breather and really trying to hit that next level on their own terms rather than by a deadline, and because their ambition continued to soar despite all of this, an ambition that got so high that it tripped them up and saddled them down in the next game and beyond. <laughs> you thought we were done? No, sit back down, I'm not giving the filler game its own video, come on! As I mentioned near the start of the retrospective, somebody higher up at Insomniac promised to throw something together as a sort of make good to make it up to Sony for scrapping that overzealous co-op promise for Tools of Destruction. This would be something that would still promote the next-gen console's features, like, say, a download-only PlayStation Network game. It'd be released in Fall 2008 to cover the two-year gap between Ratchet & Clank Future 1 and Future 2, and it would be titled Ratchet & Clank Future Quest for Booty, a game that focuses on Ratchet searching for Clank while fighting a bunch of... robot... pirate... ghosts. You either die as satire or live long enough to become that which you lampooned, apparently. For the record, I don't know who made either of these two promises, either the one for co-op or the one to make up for co-op. There's no implying here that Ratchet's creative director, Brian Allgaier, who you're seeing on screen, is responsible. He's just the one that's spoken publicly about why Quest for Booty came to be. This is also, incidentally, where my well starts to run dry when it comes to exclusive interviews because... Well, not many people even worked on Quest for Booty, fewer still have an online presence where a random dude like me could pester them, and at the time of publish, I've got a big ol' goose egg that actually responded. When Tools of Destruction finished development, much of the team jumped back over once again to help push Resistance 2 over its finish line, ahead of its also 2008 release. 
Yeah, Insomniac released two games that year, and that's how you can tell that this game wasn't meant to happen in the first place. By this point, Insomniac had jumped once again in size to around 175 active employees, many of whom would be seasonal testers for the Resistance multiplayer. Meanwhile, a chunk of the Tools of Destruction team would push forward with a bite-sized midquel that would serve a few purposes. One, address the cliffhanger rather than leave players waiting two full years for answers as to what happened to Clank. Two, avoid creating too many new assets, reuse as much as possible from tools to save time and keep the game under budget. And three, use this game's six or so month production as a springboard to test out new ideas and try to bypass the usual pre-production phase for Ratchet and Clank Future 2. Also, yes, you do keep hearing me correctly, the next game, A Crack in Time, was internally considered Future 2. That's how late of an addition Quest for Booty was. Now, say it with me, it didn't work. Okay, I set that one up in the very same video. I have to hope at least one of you said it with me this time, but I know I shouldn't get my hopes up, whatever. Trying to shave off pre-production with another game's production, I would imagine, is an unimaginably difficult thing to do, and clearly the team was put into a very tough situation. I'll go into more detail on this when it's time to talk about A Crack in Time, but simply put, Quest for Booty struggled to achieve two of its three main goals and actively hampered production of what was supposed to be the second game in the future saga. Like, so much so that half of Crack in Time's written dialogue was cut. It's pretty cool. And remember that this is after Tools of Destruction had set up so many little plot threads to be answered specifically in Future 2 because Fixman took over writing Future 1 late in the process. So he had to rush together one script to set up a second script where he would finally hopefully have the time that he wanted, and then as a nice little surprise he had to smush in a middle script too. But at the very least, the game did get away with reusing as much as possible, so much so that many players consider this game a DLC add-on rather than its own game. And hey, fair. Although it did get a physical release in Europe and later Japan anyway, so if you think about it, it even failed to be DLC. Quest for Booty follows Ratchet and Talwin in the year after Clank's disappearance, as they search for the legendary space pirate Captain Darkwater. According to the Iris supercomputer, Darkwater had successfully figured out a way to make contact with the Zoni. Ratchet and Talwin hit a rude awakening, though, as they discover that not only has Darkwater been dead for years, he was murdered by the very same Captain Slag that Ratchet defeated in the last game. Which, now that I think about it, should mean that these remaining pirates consider Ratchet their captain, just like Pete did in the last game when you killed Slag, but I guess because Rusty Pete has Slag's still talking head, Slag is technically still alive, so he's still the captain? Whatever the case, Ratchet is shot out of a cannon and stranded on Hulafar Island. Just based on the game's opening moments, you can tell that, if nothing else, the game makes some improvements to the Tools of Destruction skeleton. Despite being pretty much the same, for example, Ratchet's scruffy neckbeard model looks a little bit better to me here, thanks to the moodier, more dynamic lighting. Some of the games, like six or seven fights, have a little bit of extra weight to them because of this darker atmosphere, and in fact, the lighting reworks led to light-based puzzles and dark caverns that make up a decent chunk of Quest for Booty's new additions, too. Aside from these lighting tweaks and the addition of a new wrench tether feature that allows Ratchet to grab onto some items, such as bioluminescent creatures to light up the area around him, or move some platforms around, or throw lava rocks at doors, the core gameplay itself is effectively one-to-one -to -one tools of destruction with a slightly heavier puzzle lean. The weapon selection features exclusively a handful of guns that return from the last game, and here they all start at level 3, both to remind you that this is a sequel and because this game is only two hours long. They want you to be able to max out the guns. Ratchet also already has all of the Raritanium upgrades unlocked for each of these weapons, although once he's shot off to Hulafar Island, the upgrades have somehow fallen off and magically been scattered across the island. It's a neat little precursor to Kraken Time's Constructo weapon mods that you would find scattered as collectibles throughout that game, except here the game is only two hours long, and they really don't have enough space to hide seven upgrades. For example, two of the seven upgrades are hidden back to back in a single underwater cavern in one, I guess technically two rooms, but really just one room, and they both require you to just blow up a wall. It's not some fun little Zelda-esque puzzle like Quest for Booty likes to sprinkle in, it's just pressing the fire button twice. 
On a related note, if you want an idea of just how much of an afterthought this game truly is, Ratchet can still use the Hydro Pack underwater, despite not having Clank on his back to have the Hydro Pack at all. So it turns out this whole time that that Clank upgrade was pointless because it's just Ratchet's calves doing all the work and also making propeller noises. How... how does he do that? Since bolts aren't used for buying weapons, and in fact they're only used a couple of times to pay the smuggler for things that he quote-unquote found, like an item required for progression, or the Alpha Disruptor that Ratchet lost when he washed ashore, so... I guess you do buy one weapon with bolts, technically, since the only collectibles are the so-so weapon upgrades, and since there's no real need to work to level up your weapons, since they're all more or less guaranteed to be maxed by the end of the game because each of them only have two levels, Quest for Booties got a very strange feel compared to just about every other Ratchet game. The best way I've heard this game described was a long time ago from a good friend of mine who pointed out that it's often sort of a poor man's Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy. Here on this isolated island, Ratchet has to do a bunch of platforming challenges, puzzles, and little filler missions for the mayor and other citizens so that he can fix their line of communication to the outside world to try to get a hold of Rusty Pete. Although the Magna Boot pathways, grind rail tracks, and the overall vibe of Hulafar Island is definitely distinct compared to other Ratchet titles, it doesn't feel like there's all that much urgency here. The plot just kind of happens, and even on your first playthrough, you're already gonna know that none of this matters. By the time we're done with the opening padding fetch quests on Hulafar and we move on to the next of the game's three or four areas, we're already nearly halfway through the game, and even in the other few locations we explore afterwards, Ratchet is forced to jump through these same kinds of basic hoops and neat but ultimately meaningless puzzles to progress. Puzzles such as jump on these keys in the correct order to play the right music notes, or solve a riddle and make the right drink for this pirate bartender, or throw a lava rock at this door. Peak gameplay. But somehow, despite being, again, say it with me, two hours, the game overstays its welcome thanks to being almost exclusively one fetch quest after another. If the game they gave us is this bland, can you imagine what the rest of the year must have been like where Ratchet was searching for a lead as to the whereabouts of his best friend? Like, what was he doing, sitting on his ass eating chips? We had the Iris supercomputer in the last game, a thing that is supposed to know everything in the universe. Could it not have been possible to go up to that thing, presumably, sure, after repairing it because it kind of broke at the last game, sure, whatever, they don't care, I don't care either. Could they not have gone to it and said, hey Alexa, how do I find the Zony? Was that not a thing? Could they have not, did they think about that or did they go to the supercomputer after 11 months of searching and then realized, oh yeah, we have fucking Google. It's just, it's not as bad as Daxter at the start of Daxter. It's not that bad because Daxter forgets that Jack exists for two years, but it's pretty fucking close. And at least that one's played for laughs. This is supposed to be a serious story. I'm sorry. Once we fix up the communication array, the mayor of Hulafar shows Ratchet the Obsidian Eye, the device that Darkwater had used to study the Zoni. But the Eye needs something called a Fulcrum Star to operate, and Darkwater hid that somewhere off-island. It's at this point that Rusty Pete conveniently shows up to guide Ratchet and Talwin to the cave where Darkwater was killed. Talwin ends up immediately trapped in the cave, and Ratchet leads her behind for a bit and takes Rusty Pete right to Darkwater's corpse. But not before the most expensive line of dialogue in the series history. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is me handle, here is me spout. Yeah, so it turns out that I'm a Little Teapot is still under copyright, so Insomniac had to settle out of court for using it without permission. Amazing. It's all downhill after that, because right afterwards, Rusty Pete betrays Ratchet, attaching Captain Slag's head to Darkwater's beheaded body. But Pete is still sort of straddling this weird fence where he's not actually a bad guy, he's just loyal to his captain, so he throws your weapons down to you for some reason, and Ratchet's already got the map he needs to find the Fulcrum Star now, so Slag being back wouldn't be all that bad, if not for the robot pirate ghosts. Apparently, right before Slag had betrayed Darkwater years ago, the latter saw it coming and put a curse on his own body so that if he was ever disturbed after death, his crew would reanimate as pirate ghosts. 
So rather than Slag being our big bad, it's actually mostly Darkwater himself, just now with Slag's head attached too, and the two consciousnesses bickering back and forth sometimes. I, I don't know, it just doesn't work for me. I'm sorry, I just can't take this game all that seriously when one of our main antagonists is Rusty fucking Pete. How do you fall for the comic relief character's traps? Don't say anything about Quirk. I appreciate that Darkwater has this immense interest in Lombax and Zony technology, but that's only because I recognize that he was the original space pirate that Tachyon built specifically to hunt for that tech. But unless you scroll through all of the hidden flavor questions you can ask the supercomputer back in Tools of Destruction, you would never put that together, because the only other time in the game that they acknowledge why Slag and the robot pirates exist and are even here is if you pay careful attention to one of their poorly mixed sea shanties that you probably won't even know Notice, since these games took several more years to make sure that subtitles existed for out-of-cutscene dialogue. I have to think it's this messy because of the writer transition and Fixman having to piece together what he could get into the game on the fly with his hands tied behind his back. I can't imagine it would have been easy, but I also can't say that any of this really holds up unless you bend over backward trying to justify it in your head. I mean, Talwin's the biggest tragedy of the entire future saga. This game has pretty much the most we get out of her throughout the entire series, and she gets trapped near some rubble here, a damsel in distress that you don't even have to save technically, and then she's kidnapped half an hour later. That's another thing, Quest for Booty also brings back the dialogue prompts from Tools of Destruction, and they're just as out of place here as they are throughout all three Future Saga games. I don't know, these just always feel like the clearest attempt to follow industry trends, and they're just half-baked. The dialogue we get is almost never interesting in these. The basic over-the-shoulder camera angle covers up the uninspired programmatic lip movements and animations. The lore is so sloppily set up that the games never even earn the right to have this sort of thing. It's all just... Ugh. Here in Quest for Booty specifically, I will say that they had some fun with it, because you can actually respond to for some reason, rather than just choose from a set list of questions, and you could just make Ratchet a smartass. You have this quintessentially 2008 video game karmic choice to save Talwin in the caves, or let her find her own way out, and she'll either be thankful or pissed depending on your choice. It's such a strange thing to include since Ratchet is well past the point in his life where he would leave a friend behind like that, especially in the game where he's hunting for his missing friend. But then, considering that Talwin's nowhere to be seen in the next game, replaced by characters that Fixman created himself rather than ones that he was, for lack of a better word, burdened with having to write for, I guess technically it's probably canon to leave her there and let her find her own way out. Look, I've given this game more time than it's frankly worth. Even at two hours, it overstays its welcome. I'm just gonna run through the rest here. The second hour of the game features Ratchet and Talwin finding Darkwater's secret treasure cove. They find the MacGuffin needed to use the Obsidian Eye, Ratchet falls into a second trap because he's an idiot, Talwin is capped by Slag slash Darkwater, and the smuggler flies Ratchet over to Slagwater's fleet for the final battle. And this game, this $15 stopgap meant to plug the PSN's ability to have awesome download games, the game that's meant to follow up on the universally panned cliffhanger at the end of Tools of Destruction, it ends on another cliffhanger. When they return to the island and activate the Obsidian Eye, Ratchet and Talwin see Clank trapped in stasis, surrounded by the Zoni. They actually think they're helping him, as Clank sounds a bit loopy. X is the coefficient of A squared minus the improbability of the hypotenuse at absolute zero. The Bogon index of the denominator must be equal or lesser to the number of bees in your bonnet. <laughs> and our big reveal isn't why they took him, no, it's that they took him right into the hands of the returning Dr. Nefarious. Alright, so this reveal would be pretty awesome, I will say, if not for two things. We paid $15 for this cutscene. Pretty much none of the rest of the game matters. There's no challenge mode here, so most players will never play this game again, so this was a $15 cutscene. But more importantly, they immediately take away any threatening aura that Nefarious could have by having him trip and fall down the stairs. I can hear some of you saying that he's always been a funny, kind of clumsy character. Yes, but the thing that made him such a beloved villain in Up Your Arsenal wasn't just haha <laughs> funny, it was that he was menacing. He had plans that when put into action actually succeeded in some way. He was arguably an equal to Ratchet and Clank, one step ahead of them often, maybe just a step below overall thanks to the duo's friendship and ability to work together as a stronger team than they are alone. Which makes sense since the whole 
whole theme of this franchise is that these two friends prove to be greater than the sum of their parts, and the mostly loner Nefarious suffers for his mistrust and manipulation of others. So for Ratchet to have to go up against Nefarious alone in the next game means that he could very well fall short, and that is incredibly compelling to end a game on. But instead of really letting this tease reach its full potential, they needed to pop the viewer. I, I don't know, if anything, I actually like this ending less than Tools' cliffhanger, especially since in the context of development, that first cliffhanger may very well have been rewritten or reconfigured in order to sell units of this game, to string players along for a year while Insomniac put Kraken Time together for 2009. I don't know that for sure, that's just a supposition, but the timeline, according to my understanding, would line up. Look, this game has some fun to it. I do like some of the platforming and puzzle elements. I like the wrench tether. There's a, there's a lot that you can accept here. And I'm generally pretty accepting of the more experimental Ratchet games overall, but in the greater context of the Future Saga's production, I can't help but feel a bit sour. Imagine a world where Quest for Booty never exists, where Insomniac doesn't promise to make it up to Sony for the missing co-op in Tools. By the time that Tools had finished production, it seems like Nefarious was already locked in to be the big bad for Future 2. If Quest for Booty never exists, we very likely end up with the Nefarious reveal at the end of Tools of Destruction that he's the one somehow controlling the Zoni, a reveal that would be at the very least much more hype than Clank floating away followed by fucking disco music. If this game never happens, it doesn't cut into Kraken Time's production. Perhaps we get a more complete second game in the saga, dare I say, maybe the second game in a longer saga instead of ending there with more questions than answers. After all, according to writer TJ Fixman, if 10,000 lines of dialogue that he wrote made it into Kraken Time, another 10,000 more were cut. I don't want to be too harsh to a game that perhaps Insomniac ended up feeling obligated or, dare I say, maybe pressured to make, but it's a game that actively detracts from both of the games that sandwich it. Actually, no, screw that, I'm gonna be harsh. Quest for Booty is the video game equivalent of a meeting that should have been an email. It's the phantom menace of the Ratchet & Clank franchise, a plot so insignificant that it's summarized in just a sentence or two in the intro to the next installment. It's thanks to Tools of Destruction's embryonic days and that overambitious promise of co-op and multiplayer that we ended up with a game like Quest for Booty that seems to have thrown a wrench into the initially conceptualized plot arc for the future saga, or rather the conceptualized conceptualized on-the-fly plot arc for the Future Saga, seemingly completely rewritten once Fixman took over writing duties, but strapped down to characters and levels that were already developed but were certainly not his vision. It's thanks to TOD's, frankly, boneheaded cliffhanger that Quest for Booty acts as narrative fluff, a game that if you didn't know about its development backstory, you would have to assume only exists to address the cliffhanger only for it to end on kind of another cliffhanger itself. As a result, A Crack in Time had a shortened pre-production period and a rushed production cycle. We've heard as little as nine months for the entire game, because Insomniac hoped that developing Quest for Booty wouldn't adversely affect the next full game, and would somehow actually save time overall. It didn't. Such a thing has never happened with a game series before, as far as I can recall, unless Mark Cerny's worked his ear wizard powers to adjust the flow of time and make some hyperbolic time chamber or something. Maybe you'll be sending us a video of your ears. And this rush, in turn, seemingly led to several characters and plot points just being dropped entirely or explained away in flavor dialogue. We'll get to all of that in more detail when I talk about A Crack in Time, but that game, which many consider to be the most complete Ratchet & Clank story, the game that was marketed as likely the end of the franchise thanks to diminishing sales, sales that very possibly slowed down in part thanks to the Tools of Destruction cliffhanger pissing people off, this story that caps off the future saga spends more time introducing new species rather than truly following up on what Tools had established, and it has so much left on the cutting room floor itself that they not only wrote an entirely new epilogue game just to clean up the dropped plot points, it's got so many frayed plot threads that they still haven't addressed all of it 12 years later. And even that epilogue game had its plot shifted around early on, because just like with Deadlocked, addressing the fate of the Lombaxes or the Lombax question was, to be fair, rightfully deemed too important for an end of console game, especially in this case, one being sent out to die a few days before the PlayStation 4's launch alongside Wonderbook. 
That's how little Sony cared about that game. It launched next to Wonder Book, had one print run, and now goes for 70 plus dollars online because they only printed a handful of copies. Now, the point was always to leave some threads open for the future, of course. That's why Fixman was tasked with writing a series Bible and setting up future plot threads. And I can absolutely empathize with the guy who was thrown into the fire on his first project writing a game, tasked with writing a game that was already mostly done and only getting to actually explore some of his own ideas three games into a two-game saga. There are very few folks on the planet who could pull that off swimmingly, and outside of all of us here right now, the minority of players that love to analyze and overanalyze the stuff that we like, he did an excellent job of distracting most players from the fact that every single Ratchet project he touched was part of a string of rush jobs or attempts to cover their tracks because of other rush jobs. Speaking of covering tracks, A Crack in Time was never going to be the last Ratchet game. That has always been misleading marketing at best and a lie at worst. No, we're not done yet with Tools of Destruction's impact. That's because 2011's co-op adventure All For One was conceptualized allegedly as far back as June 2008. You know, right as Sony was pissed off about the lack of co-op and tools and wanted Insomniac to make it up to them, and that game started development in January 2009. It was developed concurrently alongside A Crack in Time across the country by some of the Insomniac team that was moved to the studio's new North Carolina location. And it's thanks to that game that it took another decade for us to get a full-sized Ratchet & Clank game afterwards. That's the game that began what many might call Ratchet & Clank's Blunder Years, an era with three titles that took on a new, controversial, perhaps more budget-looking art style, right around the time when these games started being sold at budget prices thanks to, you know, the lower budget from lower sales projections. Which, in turn, and this is entirely my own speculation here, I want to be clear, was in my opinion very likely part of the reason that Insomniac branched out for the first time ever past the PlayStation after both Ratchet and Resistance seemed to be a bit marginalized or outright shelved because of waning consumer and internal support. I mean, they partnered with EA to make a bland co-op military shooter. That should tell you how bad things were at the start of the 2010s for Insomniac. Even the PS4 game, made to tie into the Ratchet & Clank movie that I recall some Insomniacs were pitching as far back as 2007, right when Tools of Destruction came out incidentally, was developed in only about 10 months, on a tight enough budget that sacrifices had to be made on some cutscene animations, levels had to be cut, and the plot had to be adjusted a few times around the movie's script being changed by the director seemingly multiple times only for the film to be delayed twice and the game to sit essentially finished for 6 to 12 whole months. Months that could have been factored in earlier on in production to make a far more complete game. That's the game that would later splinter the core fan base and lead to some players arguing online incessantly that Insomniac didn't know how to make good games anymore, thanks to issues that the development team knew about well before we ever had a chance to even sniff the game. Issues that they couldn't exactly fix given that the game's entire existence was tied to the whims of a low-budget C-list film studio that was only chosen to get Canadian film industry tax breaks. And it took until 2021, 14 years and 96 games after Tools of Destruction, for us to get even a semblance of a morsel, of a hint, of a continuation of those frayed plot threads left for us thanks predominantly to one single overpromise during pre-production, the departure of one writer who apparently wasn't a good fit, and the frantic work of the new writer to put something remotely cogent together with his back against the wall. I don't want to come off as bitter here. Again, as I've already said, I actually really do like Tools for what it is as a game, solely on its own merits and by itself. Critically speaking, one can only judge art alone for what it is, not what it could have been. But, as I've said before with this retrospective series, you can love something and still strive for it to be better. Some of you may not care about all of this behind the scenes stuff. You do you, I totally get it. But for those of you that do, when you put Tools of Destruction into this crucial development context, you've got to question if it was all really worth it. 
was Ratchet & Clank Future's ambitious promise of a story that would be too big for just one game worth it when so much of the story never really got finished in any of the games. As much as any of us may love a crack in time, who among us wouldn't throw a game like Quest for Booty out of existence even for a chance at getting the finished version of Crack in Time that the pirate game robbed from us? Without Insomniac scrambling to make it up to Sony for realizing that Tools Co-op wasn't feasible, who's to say that this series doesn't end up as overexposed as it did during those blunder years, which in turn could have led to a less fractured fanbase that debates, or dare I say, seethes over the more recent games even today. I know so many fans criticize the perceived lack of edge the PS3 games onward have had, but maybe it's just that after years of pushing, years of grinding, dare I say, years of crunching to get these games out, albeit crunching less and less with each game as the studio admittedly continued to improve its project management with each subsequent title, after that grind, after the usual industry turnover, Maybe there just wasn't much edge left in the studio. It was all sanded down. Now, all of it naturally has to be more complicated than just these one or two butterfly flaps, this one overpromise that spiraled over the course of years across franchises with an intercompany partnership that later ended with Sony willingly spending hundreds of millions of dollars to buy Insomniac outright anyway. There are thousands of factors at play that none of us are ever likely to know no matter how much research we can do. I'm not one to dwell on what-ifs for long, even if they're interesting questions to ponder, but a lot of this, it's not a what-if. At a certain point, the cracks aren't just showing, they are prominent. And while I may have a soft spot for so much of what the Future Saga did, for giving me the deeper lore and story beats that I wanted back when I grew up playing the earlier PS2 games, Looking back in retrospect, years after those story beats were hastily, if ever, wrapped up, sometimes I can't see the finished picture in a vacuum the way that I used to. All I see? All I see are those cracks. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and joining me on this journey through most of the Future Saga. If you're not already subscribed, and I know for a fact based on my other videos that about 85% of you watching right now are not subscribed, please make sure to do so. Even if half of you hit that dumb subscribe button right now, YouTube would probably have to send me a silver play button like next week, and that'd be pretty cool. Truly, subscribing, hitting the like button, commenting, and sharing really does help the channel grow and reach new viewers just like you, and it allows me to make better videos more consistently. As you can tell, hundreds of hours goes into each of these Ratchet & Clank projects alone, so your support means the world. I'll be getting to crack in time soon enough. I know a lot of you are going to be waiting for that one, but I have another big project that I want to tackle first, so I appreciate your patience. Hopefully, I've shined some new light on these games and taught you something about their development or about the behind-the-scenes process that went into making them. Maybe I've helped you find a new appreciation for them, or I've given you more justification for why the Future Saga never sat right with you. With these games, it could go either way, and I'd truly, really love to hear your personal thoughts in the comments. I do try to read most of them. And also, I have to give a massive thanks to those of you that have gone above and beyond with your support on Patreon and elsewhere. I'm incredibly grateful, including, and I'm gonna try and do this in one breath here, Goldstorm07, Anon42, Drasolite, Philly D360, The FOE3, Vincent Bahari, Calico Plus, Cooking Mama, Dervinator, L Pineapple, The Crazy Even, Harry, James Boss, Jess, The Milkman, Terminally Nerdy, Tabriz Sadiq, Wolf Chaosan, and Buckles Chucklo, as well as everybody else on screen. You folks are incredible. Your support truly does help these retrospectives come out more frequently and at a higher quality, and hopefully never a longer length than this, good God. I would never get these done on my own without your support, and if you'd like to see your name on this ever-growing list, if you'd like access to videos and updates early, if you'd like to help me select topics to cover, or if you want access to the exclusive Golden Bolt Discord server and more, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Whether you're binging some of my older videos or waiting for the next one, I'm sure I'll see you soon. So, until then, stay safe, and stay golden.